से वासुदेवाया हरि बोल सो अम अ टॉपिक दैट्स नॉट अ हैप्पी टॉपिक and i'm talking about it in response to a few questions that i got otherwise i probably wouldn't have chosen it school or mass mass shootings why and it's in relation to something that has just occurred in america where 17 children were murdered and two teachers by a very troubled and demented individual and it's kind of like well, why and there's been a whole succession of these it's sort of like what's what's going on and the question and the idea is there some way to prevent it if i ask you that question how could it have been prevented and not just this one even previous ones how how could they be prevented sort of like there's no easy answer particularly if you look at it a bit more closely in america the big debate between two opposing political parties is you know we got to stop the sale of guns and it's just like you know that would be an extremely slow and long solution if it was actually a solution at all because there's a particular problem in America in that their constitution enshrines the right to own and to bear arms and of course that was written in there because there was a history of abuse and grave violence and the killing of people by England imposing their rule and control and so the people living in the colonies rebelled and and had to fight a war and the people that wrote the constitution they wanted to make sure that they knew that governments can become tyrannical and they wanted to make sure that people always had the means to savagely push back and even to fight off an oppressive government and so the idea of being able to have as a right you know to have guns and to i mean one of one of the things the british did was try to confiscate guns of course it was in their interest them wanting to control and so this is part of their constitution this there's uh, from what i've heard more guns in america than there are people and so it's kind of like what now you're going to make legislation you know to impose 
heavy controls and what, you're going to take everybody's guns away? You know, it's just not going to work. And this idea that, okay, we at least we need to stop these weapons of war, as they've been called now, the AR-15. It's kind of like, well, is that really going to make a difference? When 77% of all the mass shootings are done with handguns, almost 80%. So even if you took away the AR-15s, then how are you going to deal with, with what's remain? Oh, we're going to have all these controls on how to make it so that you know, people can't buy them. Well, I think the figure is 80% of all the school shootings that were performed by young people 80% were with guns that they borrowed or stole from friends, relatives, parents. So, you know, it, it's like a real complex issue. And there is a certain argument to be made that perhaps... The big problem is not the weapon of choice, but it's like what's driving people to do this? I don't know. For you guys, is it kind of shocking or horrific? I mean, you all have children, or not all one, but some of you have children, and some of you have grandchildren. And what drives a person to single out little children and shoot them and hear the screaming and the begging and they just cause this carnage? It's sort of like, what's going on with that person? You know, this is, this is a way bigger issue and in many ways a much more important issue than the weapon of choice. Do you know what the first mass killing was in America? It's kind of mind-blowing. It's like over a hundred years ago where somebody was on a school board and he, I think, I may have this wrong, he got you know, dislodged or fired from the school board. And so he was so upset, he planted explosives in the school and blew it up. No guns. <laughs> As they say, where there, where there is a will, there is a way. And it's sort of, once again, it's like, why would you do that? I mean, I understand if you're angry at the, the board members who got rid of you, but why the children? And in that one, I think there were 49 children killed in a massive explosion. So, I mean, some of the things that I'm raising here, are, you know, that it's problematic. How, how do you actually deal with this? For me, it really points to a deeper systemic problem in society and of the individuals who are making up society. But people like to just, you know, what you hear in the news and what the media often gets involved in is the political football 
that everybody's kicking around and trying to win a game. But, you know, there's this massive unwillingness to really look at things behind it. I mean, how, how can you shoot an 8-year-old or a 10-year-old and ever think that that's okay? If you have ever been with someone that killed, for instance, an animal, for most people that experience is already kind of, you know, disturbing, unless you're hardened to it. It is disturbing. And even people that do it habitually, if you talk to them about it, it's, you know, they know there's something deeper going on there. So in, in America, they, there were a couple of people who were behind establishing the building of a massive database on mass killings and interviewing people and collecting data for the purpose of trying to find a solution. It's called the Violence Project. And the focus is just on these, on these mass killings. For me, it's a little disturbing. I, I actually get a little bit irritated with political responses and how people that seek political power want to use social issues and things that really need addressing, but actually they're just manipulating them in order to gain power and influence. Like in the last couple of years, there's been this massive movement in America where everybody's focused on the police killing black people. And, you know, that's got a sort, certain appeal to it and people can get all fired up by it. Two years ago, the number of people black people that were killed by white police officers was five. People that were killed that, you know, the circumstance may point to some misuse of a weapon or power. In that same year, 10,000 black people died from guns, 10,000. That's like 30-something a day were dying at the hands of drug dealers and gangs. And we're talking about children and innocent people that are caught in the crossfire. You know, it, it's like, it's an epidemic of violence and nobody's out in the street protesting about that but they'll protest when a policeman shoots somebody I'm not saying that the policeman's doing anything right but it's kind of like well, how sincere are we to seek change when we are so narrow in our focus and the similar thing happens in relation to the issues that we're discussing now. You know, if the solution is not going to be political per se, it's going to have to be involve the broader society. 
So in the violence project, they collected information on 172 mass public shooters from 1966 to 2019 and covered more than 150 psychosocial history variables regarding the shooters, including such things as mental health history, trauma, and demographic details. So the, these guys have done a, an amazing amount of work. You know, they also, in many cases, the people that undertake these shootings are suicidal. And engaging in these mass shootings is part of an attempt to commit suicide themselves. And so the majority do not survive. And so then you have to go to family members, you know, people that knew them, that worked with them to interview them. They've done all these really in-depth interviews looking to garner information. And the problem is it's not pointing to any clear solutions. The trend over time, and I'm reading from some of these reports, the trend over time shows a marked increase in mass shootings, with more than half of those studied occurring after the year 2000. So since 1966 up to the year 2000, over half of all the killings happened since 2000. 2000 to 2019, and 20% of them are in the last five years of the study period. The death toll from mass shootings has also risen sharply from an average of eight deaths per year in the 1970s to 51 per year from 2010 to 2019. That's averaged out. 16 of the 20 deadliest mass shootings occurred between 1999 and 2019. So in the last 20 years, 16 of the 20 largest ones. Two thirds of the mass shooters in the database had a documented history of mental health problems. And while this may seem high, they state, researchers point out that roughly 50% of Americans have experienced some kind of mental health problem at some point in their lives. So there you go, 66% of the killers had mental health issues. But that's not very shocking when 50% of the entire population has or will suffer a mental health problem. And when you consider so many people are kids, it's a shockingly high percentage. K through 12, you know what that means? Kindergarten through the 12th grade. What's the equivalent here? That's like the last year of high school. The last year of high school. So students in this category who engaged in mass shootings were found to be suicidal 92% of the time while college and university level students who engaged in mass shootings were suicidal 100% of the time. So that's kind of like, oh, so you think that some gun legislation's gonna deal with that issue? 
the fact that the person has got suicidal you know ideas and is looking to act on it in terms of past trauma 31% of persons who perpetrated mass shootings were found to have experiences of severe childhood trauma, not moderate, severe. And 80% of them were in crisis. Another thing that you always hear is the majority of shooters are white males. It is absolutely true that the majority of mass killers are male. I think it's about 97%. But when they break it down by race categories, the whites are not the biggest percentage of killers. They're large because they're the largest group in the population. But there are other groups, at least one other one, that has a higher rate of, of committing them. There's another new statistic that's out. The police expect that when there is a mass shooting, another one is expected to occur within 13 days. And they categorize mass shootings as where four or more people die, including the gunmen. So in looking at the issues related to the individual perpetrators, aggression, social rejection, narcissism, fame-seeking, low self-esteem, and depression are the commonalities with mass killers. Specifically, mass shooters. So they all have these commonalities. Aggression, social rejection, narcissism, fame-seeking, and low self-esteem. They have a tendency to identify or idolize antisocial characters, even fictional characters. They idolize them. <sighs> this is a bit overwhelming when we consider that is actually all of these problems. The idea, I mean, hearing that the first mass school killing was undertaken by a board member who was meant to be a responsible individual who planted a bomb in the school because he was pissed with the board, the education board, and killed 49 kids. So it's sort of like, if you look at all these complexities, anybody that wants to, you know, just go on about, like, controlling guns is going to solve the problem. I think that easy access to guns is, is a massive problem. I mean, we've, there was a, an, another killing just after this, this school shooting, where somebody went into a hospital 
and killed three people and then shot himself, killed himself. The guy had a, had a back injury and he had had an operation. But after the operation, he was still in pain. And he was trying to get hold of the doctor and complain. And he was having a hard time getting hold of the doctor. And so he got so angry, he went and bought a gun and went to the hospital, shot the doctor, and he said anybody else that would get in the way, which included another female doctor and another staff member in the hospital. And it's kind of like, well, even if you had a legitimate gripe with that surgeon, you had a legitimate complaint why do you think killing somebody is okay? And what about just anybody that got in the way of you doing that? You thought it was okay to kill them too. You don't see their family, the husband of the doctor that are killed, the children, the family members that are just utterly traumatized by what happened. You know, and, and what you can see in these situations is like extreme self-centeredness, where it's all about me and my massive problems in life. And I just can't handle it anymore. The guy that did the last school shooting, he had a little bit of a speech defect. He had a really bad lisp, and I think he might have stuttered a little bit. And of course, everybody knows that children can be absolutely horrific with each other. And to think otherwise is just not very not very informed. As much as we want to educate and try and help children not be like that, they have a tendency to be like that, to be quite hurtful in the way they speak and treat other kids. And so this guy was ostracized because of this. So this is one of the characteristics of these people that, you know, perform these activities. They feel cut off from everyone. They feel like they've been degraded, humiliated, and, and ostracized. So feeling rejection from your peers is, is very common. So how, how are you going to regulate that? Are you going to pass some law? You know, obviously you, you can't do that. So another point in, in another study, a great deal of mass shooters in the United States have also been known to commit their massacre with the gaining of fame as one of their motives. Fame seeking is one of many traits mass shooters tend to have in common. Take everybody's phone away, no more selfies, self-promotion, I mean, you ask most kids, what do you want? They want to be famous. They'd like to be an influencer, a model, a rock star. You know, most kids have those kind of dreams. People dream about fame. So it's kind of like, whoa. So they all, all these guys, they then turn that desire for fame to notoriety, 
to do something that everybody will pay attention to and you will forever be known as the one who killed all the kids. And then what happens? Because media organizations can make money, they hype the stories and there is like hyper focus. You would think in an adults in a sensible society would get together and say, well, let's deprive them of the one thing that they seek. Let's have a decision on how we are going to report this and it's going to be limited and controlled. I'm not talking about hiding, but why, why give them what they want? And then the same, the same newspapers are all on about, oh, we need to stop them having guns. Hey, you're just promoting the crap out of this person. You've got them all over the place. You're giving them exactly what they wanted. And other people are reading these things and hearing these things and going, I'm going to do that too. I got so much stuff here, it's depressing. <laughs> of course, we understand from a... The only way that you're going to find an actual solution is for people to foster a more spiritual outlook on life. The work that I've done in prisons and some of the people that I've met either on our programs or through going to prisons, some other people that have had big turnarounds in their life, definitely show that a person, every single person, can be reformed. Every single person can manifest a condition of, of love and caring and compassion and kindness and be motivated to do good. Every single person is capable of this. So what is it that we need to do as a society to, to bring about these changes? I mean, our current situation and the model that we're following is not helpful we have this massive social breakdown, the breakdown of, of the family. While families are always far from perfect, all clinical psychologists who are not acting politically meaning promoting some political or social ideology that are actually just straight practitioners. Talk about the effect on children who grow up in a one-parent family. And in fact, a big, big percentage of these, of these mass murderers and these school shooters come through these environments. A big percentage of them have not had an active father figure in their life. Someone that actually really instills discipline. I'm not saying that the mother doesn't instill but women have different psychology. 
They're caring nurturers. I mean, in a regular family, and everybody can remember probably from their childhood, mum's gone, how many times do I have to tell you to stop doing that? And the kids are still doing it. And then dad walks in the room, hey! (laughs) And suddenly it stops. You know, we have different roles. I mean, we live in a time when they're trying to erase all of the natural differences. They're trying to re-engineer the psychology of humans. And they won't be successful. They will just cause more havoc because of it. But there are structures that are needed. And one of the important things is also examples to follow. Good examples to follow. There's some guy, I, I, somebody showed me a, a video. There's some guy on YouTube. He grew up without a father. And it was a struggle for him in his life. And he realizes that how much help he actually needed. And so he, he, he's put out all these instructional videos for young boys who don't have fathers in their lives. And they always begin with, hey, dad, how do you? (laughs) And then whatever that's going to be, like learning how to shave and, you know, dealing with biological changes and how to fix a car and how to deal with, you know, in relationships and how should I deal with this situation and how do I talk to girls and, you know, He's he's just got like a whole bunch of them just based on his personal experience. But there is this need for people to have structure in their life, to have examples in their life, and not to be in la-la land, these fantasy expectations that life should be perfect. Life is filled with imperfection. Life is filled with challenges. A few people, because of karmic things, get it what appears to be easy. But everybody else has got to put in the hard yards. They need to do the work. They need to do all these things. Nothing comes easy. But when you've got people that are are making a million dollars a year, even three million dollars a year as an influencer, it's like, what the hell has happened there? And then all these kids watching that And now this becomes their, you know, their go-to. If I can just be an influencer, maybe if I become a porn star, you know, I can make all the money and have the wonderful life. This is just like really removed from reality. And of course, the biggest thing that it that it arises that arises is how in this type of living there is no awareness of my eternal spiritual being everybody has become overly obsessed and engrossed with the body and the ideas of the body and wanting the body to be the perfect fly trap to trap those that they consider desirable. And so there's all these struggles. I mean, have you seen some of the photos going around of this guy that, you know, did the school shooting? You know, he's got the pouty look and 
sucking the cheeks in and he's standing behind a thing that looks like a halo behind him and got the phone up and, you know, taking all these creepy pictures. And he thinks that that look is desirable and cool. It's like, whoa, people have, have seriously lost the plot. And we live in a time when that has become magnified by social media and big tech who are knowingly taking over people's lives, preying on insecurities, studying how to make people more addicted, doing all of these things just to exploit them. There's going to be some massive suits, lawsuits coming down, down the road. There was one that was just successful in Australia where an Australian politician sued a guy that was putting out all of these videos, calling him all kinds of things, and there was no truth to it. And it was Google, the owner of YouTube, that was then promoting and serving those and broadening the audience. So the guy that was making it, in the end, he'd made an apology and he paid $100,000. But Google got hit. Did you guys see that? Was it for $700,000? Google has been ordered by the courts to pay for actively promoting and expanding these malicious and untruthful videos. This is just the beginning. It's going to be happening in, in Europe big time. And, and this is actually highly beneficial. It's not a positive move in a positive direction. It's just sort of stemming the, you know, all the water that's flooding and overflowing the dikes. It's kind of like, you know, it's just shoring up the dikes. You know, we have this problem also with parents becoming disconnected from their children. They don't even know what their kids are doing. They think that their kids are, because they're at home, that it's all okay. They don't know that their sons and daughters are dealing with all these creepy people on the internet, that they're watching all these horrific things, that they're as these guys state in the report, marinating in porn. You know, if, if your kids are in their bedroom with a device, don't think that they are in your house. You don't even know who they're dealing with and what's going on. And what effect and influence, you know, they've been subjected to. So if we want to breed resilience, compassion, kindness in people, it's not going to happen society-wide unless there is a, a transformation of individuals. I mean, what we need to do in our own lives is to become, as the saying goes, to become the change that you seek. For us to begin actively engaging in transformative activity, Compassion and kindness are, are, are really important. 
lowering expectations of the world and of others. The only thing that you can count on in life is that you are going to die. Make the time between now and when that event happens, make that time worthwhile. Worthwhile doesn't mean you go out and seek to live it up and go wild. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die, as the famous line goes. No, that's not what we're promoting at all. But make that time something of value. And the measurement of value will be by what you can do for others. We have an eternal spiritual nature. And that spiritual nature is not to take, but it is to give. And so when people act on the basis of kindness, people become happy. Whereas if you act on the basis of taking, you become unhappy. It's universally true. But until people begin to actually cultivate a deeper and more spiritual approach to their life, these problems are not going away. They are going to become worse. And no amount of regulation and law is going to change anybody. I'll tell you one thing, and a lot of people will get un upset with me saying this. 50 years ago and before that, the majority of the people in the world, regardless of what country or culture, everybody had this idea of as you sow, so you shall reap. That I will be held to account for all of my choices and all of my actions. I will not be able to escape justice within the context of different religions or different spiritual perspectives. That, that was a common idea. Now, with the degradation of, of religion, the undermining of any idea of you know, religion or God or some higher truth, it's kind of like, well, what do you expect when nobody thinks that they're ever going to be accountable for anything? What's, what's the thing that's going to curb extraordinarily bad or evil behavior? I mean, it's not the only answer, but it's important. Okay, how's that? It's a bit of a crappy subject. But I think what we should be experiencing is the alarms going off. You know, we need to start in our life, in our circle of influence, those people that are closest to us, that we actually have some influence over, particularly young people. It's hard, and you have to make sacrifices. But if you don't do it, who's going to do it? As the saying goes, think big, act small. Think big, meaning of higher, you know, reality. And then act small on a, on a personal level. Okay. Until the next shooting. 
It's so bad. And it's accelerating. You know, people want to point the finger also at a lot of these people are involved in, in violent video games. But not everybody that's involved in violent video games becomes a school shooter. You haven't done that recently, have you? No. Yeah. <laughs> but one, one, one needs to understand the effect of things. This is, this is a, a statistic from 1992. 1992. The average American child or teenager views 10,000 murders, rapes, and assaults on television each year. So you can imagine since 1992, that's probably escalated a lot. And you can't say that doesn't affect people. You know, there was a study done in Canada where there was no television reception in this particular area. This is quite a famous study. And so they wanted to gather statistics on the population because they were going to move in television antennas so that they could pick up the signal. And they did research on that then over time the change that manifests in children. It was negative effect. Thank you very much. So let us do the thing that we know makes a difference. Let us chant these spiritual sounds which fortify us. They provide us with the spiritual nutrition to deal with this emptiness and desolation that people experience. And they awaken us to another reality, a higher spiritual reality and experience. So I will chant um, the Om Hari Om mantra. mantra.
Haribo. Thank you very much. Oh.